This message entitled, Just Another April Fool's Joke, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on Easter Sunday, April 1st, 2018, by the Rev. Roy D. Warren, Jr. The scripture reference is Mark 16, 1-8. Mark 16, 1-8. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, had brought seven spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Yeah. Amen. Lord, we lift up your holy name on this holiest of days. And I pray, dear God, that you'll just speak into holy hearts and bring us into a far deeper understanding of the things of God than we've ever had before. We do pray, dear God, that you'll have all the glory for that too. As you bring us, Lord, into a true belief, a real belief. Not just belief in our minds, but, the, but belief that is displayed in our lives, throughout all of our lives. We thank you, Lord. We pray this all, dear God, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Praise God. All right. Just an April Fool's joke, and it's a question. Is this day just an April Fool's joke? A lot of people think so. I think. A lot of people don't believe in this. A lot of people don't care to believe. They don't want to believe. But that's because they don't know the reality of it. For a lot of people, it's just fake, foolish, and so forth. Okay? So, that's where we're going to start. Praise the name of Jesus. That's where it all starts. Many people, I think, take advantage of April Fool's Day, or sometimes it's called All Fool's Day, as a day for pranks and practical jokes. And certainly that's what it has become, and has been that way for a long, long time. Some believe the origin of the holiday evolved as part of an uh, ancient spring festival, Another common theory holds that the holiday began when countries adopted the Gregorian calendar in 1582, reformed from the Julian calendar, and the date for New Year changed from April 1st. See, at one time, New Year's was celebrated on April 1st. Switching it over to January 1st, which is where it is right now. Without modern media, word of this change spread rather slowly. Some people chose to ignore the change altogether and stayed back with uh, April 1st. Others called the reluctant changers, 
the reluctant changers, fools. Called them fools. Well, isn't that about the way you feel about the people that keep changing the, the clocks back and forth and, <laughs> and all of that? You know, why don't you just pick one and stick with it, you know? And not put everybody through all these changes. Well, praise God we got a clock that's accurate no matter what time of the year it is. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Others called the uh, reluctant changers fools and played practical jokes on them, such as giving them invitations to non-existent parties. And then they show up totally embarrassed because there's no party there after all, and it's April Fool's. Amen? Now, if I wanted to play a really good April Fool's joke, I could take this rubber snake and throw it over towards Debbie. <laughs> But I would not do that. <laughs> People celebrate April Fool's Day in the United States, in France, Great Britain, Germany, Canada, and some other countries. The French call an April Fool's prank a poison d'avril. I have no idea if I pronounced that right. Doesn't matter, you don't know either. <laughs> but that literally means April fish. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Funny, huh? <laughs> See? Funny. And in Scotland, it is an April gauk. April gauk or cuckoo. Right? Cuckoo. Cuckoo. You know, the cuckoo clock, right? Yeah. The usual practical jokes involving getting others to believe something that isn't really true, like telling them there's a spider next to them, you know, on their seat, or like I say, a, 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 a snake in hand or whatever, any of these kind of things. Or uh, sending them on a fool's errand, you know, to go get something and it's not there. The Bible does have a lot to say about fools. We've been reading through the Bible in one year, and I hope many of you are. Um, but the, where we're at now in our reading plan is Proverbs. Now, if there's one book in the Bible that tells you clearly who a fool is, it's Proverbs. I mean, it's verse after verse after verse. The fool does this, the wise man does that. You know, just on and on and on. It's all through the book. I thought about getting in there and digging some of those out, but I thought, well, I think you know that already. I think you know Proverbs is loaded with that kind of thing. So I just decided to let that part go. But you can look it up for yourself. It's, it's chapter 15, 16, 17, 18. I don't know exactly how far you can go with it, but it's, I'm still hearing about fools and wise men and so forth. Proverbs alone contains numerous verses that describe fools. That is, not people who lack intelligence. That's not what it's talking about. That's not even what the word fool is referring to. Lacking intelligence. But those who have character defects. We've been talking about the character of God and the character of Jesus all along. Ever since after Christmas. Praise God. All through Epiphany, all through the season of Lent, and now even up to today. Actually, the fool is quick-tempered, slanderous, unreliable, arrogant, and babbling. They feed on trash instead of truth. They despise their parents' correction. These are all things the Bible says about it. And think about doing, the thinking about doing wrong is fun. They have to be guided with a rod. You know, has to be chastened. Whack, whack, whack. Guide them. They start to go off this way. Whack, whack. To go off the other way. And just follow the leading of the, um, the uh, rod. David, I believe, cut to the chase. In the first verse of both Psalms 14 and 53. 14 and 53. The first verses of those chapters. Only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. 
That's what it comes down to. That there is no God. That there is no Jesus. That we don't need to listen to what he has to say and all the rest of it. That's the fool. When he defines fools as those who don't believe in God. These people may be highly... Oh, did I mention that today is April Fool's Day? It just occurred to me, maybe I hadn't even said it. Today is April 1st. It's April Fool's. So, is this thing Easter? Is, is that just another April Fool's joke? Or what? Those people may be highly educated. They may have high IQs. That's not the issue. But they live their life as if there is no God. Whether they say they believe in God or not, it doesn't matter. There are a lot of people running around not living for God. Period. Not living for God. And that's the fool. As a result, they are not able to tell right from wrong. They rely on their own judgment, not realizing that to ignore God or deny His existence makes them fools. And not just one day a year, but every day of the year. Not just on April Fool's Day. You see, it's not just those who don't believe, but it's also those who don't live for God. Because living for God is part of believing God. If you're not living for God, you don't really believe Him. That's why we need to get back. We need to get back to the Gospel. Those things go very much together. You can't just, you can't just say, oh yes, I believe in God, and then live for the devil. I mean, you just, that's not how that works. They're not just saying it, they are saying it in their hearts. Did you notice the scripture said that? Only fools say in their hearts. It's not just out of the mouth. It's, a, it's from the heart. There is no God. And I know many could say, many of us could even say, well, I believe there's a God. Yeah, but are you living it? You know, do you let Him be life in you and be the driving force of life in you? That's true belief. And so the scripture is still true. Only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. Now, people would say there is a God, but if they're not living for God, then they don't really believe. Alright? I believe Easter presents us with one of the best days of de demarcation. A division. A place where it becomes obvious what the truth is and what the fake stuff is. You know, the truth and the um, falsehood. And they can go side by side. But I believe Easter is one of those days that can place a demarcation, a line of demarcation. You know what I'm talking about by demarcation? That it separates it out and makes it clear. This and this. Easter is one of those days, I believe. One of the best days of demarcation. Obvious sign of reality versus obvious sign of of foolishness. And this gospel is, I think, and I'm talking about the gospel of Mark, this gospel is one of the best places to see that, for it is the first gospel account that was even written, as I mentioned earlier, it was written 14 years after the resurrection. Now, it might be normal for you to think, well, wait a minute, that's a long time. Shouldn't they get started on it the next week? Listen, they didn't even know what was going on for a while after the resurrection. You know, they had issues. They went back to fishing. They, you know, they had other thoughts and couldn't figure it out and, and all of that. And that took some time. And Jesus spent 40 days of his eternity, 40 days of his eternity up in heaven, making it clear who he was. Not appearing to Pilate, not appearing to Herod, not uh, appearing to uh, Caiaphas or Annas or any of them, but appearing to his own followers because they needed to really believe. 
They were going to start off in this church and, and head this thing up and go God's direction. They needed to know. Amen? They needed to know. I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen? This is the first gospel ever written. It's, it's therefore smaller than the rest. It's, it's real quick. <laughs> okay, it's right out there. It's plain in its point. And even at the resurrection, belief is rampant. They're, they, they don't get it. And I'm not saying we would get it any better. I'm simply saying God in His mercy, Jesus in His mercy, Amen, mercy, I say, is truly revealing and making plain and making clear and manifesting like we saw back in the season of Epiphany uh, exactly who He is. There's no camouflage going on. There's no pretense going on. There's no faking out the foolishness. It's just plain reality. And the reality of the situation is we all need Jesus. Amen? They do, we do, everybody does. Let me show you what I mean. Go to Mark 16. If you're already there, then you've got a little bit of a head start. Okay, Mark 16. We're pretty much going to stay here. Not like the other day where, you know, uh, on Good Friday and uh, Palm Sunday, you know, I was really dipping into all of the other accounts. But this one I want to see for what it really is. And when the Sabbath, this is 16 verse 1, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had, brought, had bought uh, sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. They had every intention of getting into that tomb. I suppose not remembering that there was a stone put in front of it. Because how are they going to get in? They finally realized that as they came up to it. Oh, boy, we didn't think of that. How are we going to get in there? But they had every intention. This was not fake news. This was not um, a, a perverted uh, idea of what they were doing or a joke. This wasn't a joke. Okay? Uh, they, brought, they bought sweets, but you don't buy them for a joke. How far do you go for a joke? You know? Oh, I've gone some distance for jokes, but, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, jokes can run into a lot of money, you know, if you have to buy stuff for it and props for it and all that. These aren't props. They were planning on getting in there. They were going to anoint the body of Jesus. Why? Because they loved Him. Because they wanted to honor Him. They knew He was dead and they knew He was in that tomb. And now they can't even get in. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the, unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. This, in a sense, is one of... Well, I'll put it this way. This is a pre-resurrection appearance. Because it's angels that the women see. It's not Jesus at this point. So this is the empty tomb. Which is still an appearance. But it's of angels leading the way to Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not listed in the list of resurrection appearances. Because it's not Jesus. But it's the angels explaining that he's raised from the dead. Amen? They said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. For it was very great. They saw. This would be crucial for all of them. Because you have to see. You have to hear. You have to know in order to believe. Amen? And so this would have to happen. There would have to be a reality to an empty tomb. Amen? That Jesus is not in that tomb anymore. Why? Because he's raised from the dead. That's what the angels said. 
And that, in a sense, is a resurrection appearance. Not of Jesus, but flat, true statement that Jesus is raised. Amen? And when they looked, they saw. They saw. Now watch how many times the word saw, or seek, or behold, is in the next few verses. Just watch this. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, which had the stone rolled away already, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment, and they were affrighted. They were sick with fear and worry. How did this come to be? How is his body gone? Saw a young man. Well, that young man, you know, is an angel. So it's not Jesus. It's a young man. Sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. Matthew mentions that there was an angel. Luke mentions there were two angels, which means there actually were two, for sure. Because no gospel is wrong. It's just that the one gospel chose, or by God's leading, to not mention the other angel. For some reason. I don't know. I don't know. God had a reason to just mention one angel at one place and two angels at another. But it's all true, so there were two angels. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? I think that's crucial, because otherwise you're going to come away disbelieving. You're going to come away not believing the truth that there were angels there. Amen? Because you're, you're a lot of people look at that and they say, well, see, one gospel mentions two, one gospel mentions one, so somebody's wrong. No, nobody's wrong. God chose for one gospel writer to mention one angel and for one to mention two angels. Had a reason, had a purpose. And you can probably dig all your lives to try to find out what some of these reasons were. Some of them I think are pretty obvious, but maybe others aren't. Be not affrighted, he said. You seek Jesus. You saw the stone rolled away. You saw a young man in the sepulcher. And you are seeking Jesus of Nazareth. Amen? Amen? You are seeking Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. That's what the angel finally said. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. And what you have here is the shorter version, the Reader's Digest version of the resurrection appearance to the women at the tomb. Okay? See the place where they laid him. But, go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. And there shall ye see him. As he said unto you. You can almost picture Jesus about to let out one of those I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. You know, like that guy at the uh, hotel in Manhattan, you know. I'm not getting so many people on the elevator, you know, and then it got stuck in between floors. Nobody ever told us how many people on the elevator, except there was a sign on the wall. <laughs> but anyway, I tell you and I tell you and I tell you. <laughs> he hadn't said anything. <laughs> I tell you. Well, I think what he means is, I've told people this thousands of times. Don't put so many people on, <laughs> on one elevator at the same time. So praise God. And they went out quickly, now watch, and fled from the sepulcher. They're scared stiff. This, none of this is making any sense to them. For they trembled and were amazed, and neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now God can use fear for his purposes. If somebody goes ahead and allows themselves to get fearful, he can still use it for his purposes. He doesn't make everybody change their mind and do the right thing. 
You know, he lets people have free choice. And a lot of people are choosing sin instead of glorifying God. So a lot of times there's, there's going to be consequences with that. Well, I think this is kind of a positive thing in a way. It says that they went out quickly and they fled from the sepulcher, okay, away from it, all right, uh, and it was the place of darkness, so it is important to get away from it. For they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man. That is the part I think was the blessing upon them in that time. They did not stop to tell other people right then. They were told to go back and tell the disciples. Right? Not talk to every Tom, Dick, and Harry along the road about this thing. It'd take all day. You'd be telling people... St now later, yeah, you can tell people. I mean, but that's not what Jesus said. Amen? So they were so scared that they didn't tell anybody along the way. Praise the name of Jesus. This word for afraid is phobeo. We get the word phobos from that. And... Um, you know, it's obviously speaking of a paralyzing type fear, I guess you could say. Literally, it means alarmed, uh, to revere in awe. They're scared. They're scared. And so they don't say anything to anybody, and that's a good thing. Because pretty soon, you're telling somebody, and then you're telling somebody else, and then you're telling somebody else, and they're all coming up with answers for you. Actually, this didn't happen. Actually... You're believing a myth. Uh, obviously, this man Jesus you're looking for is not raised from the dead. He's still dead. He was dead once. He's dead again. That's the kind of stuff they would have heard. So they didn't stop and tell people right then at that moment. They needed that time to run back and get back to the disciples and let them know, let them check it out, let them come back and then see how much belief there is in these, in these people. Uh, Mark's gospel is very peculiar with this. It's got like almost nothing but unbelief. Almost nothing. But it's the unbelief that gave them the opportunity to come into a true and real belief because then it's proven to be true. When he shows up and talks to people and touches people and they touch him, then it's proven to be true. Proven. You can't hold the unbelief anymore. Amen? But it all started with unbelief. Really, when you think about it, it started with unbelief with you too. And with me too. Right? You know, when was it we were actually born again? You know, for many of us, it was well into our 30s, perhaps 40s. You know, we didn't believe. We might think we can say, oh yeah, I believe, but I just didn't do this, or I just didn't do that. Well, you're not believing if you're not following God's ways. Amen? Praise God. Yes, it was time to see Jesus. Enough of this seeing angels, enough of this discussing it with them. It's time to see Jesus. It was a time to embrace Jesus. It was a time to be His you see, the April Fool's joke is imaginary. Unless you're really some kind of sicky, you know, that would actually throw a real snake over at Debbie. <laughs> That's sick. Yeah. That's sick. Or for me to plant a spider next to Cheryl or something, you know. No, the April Fool's joke is a joke. Right? It's not real. But in the heat of the moment, you think it's real, or it could be real, <laughs> knowing that pastor. <laughs> All right? No, the joke is imaginary. It's made up. Praise God. Amen? There was once a group of modern artists 
And they had their share of critics. They had people that didn't like their art or believe in their art or anything. I'm talking about modern. I'm talking about, um, you know, abstract. You know, just weird designs and stuff. And it all means something to them, but nobody else has any inkling as to what it's all about. These modern artists, they've got many, many critics, even today. One man, a photographer exhibited his works alongside the works of the several modern artists. That afternoon, there was decided a very decided lull in the activity at the gallery, and the artists and the photographer uh, started uh, talking about art. Uh, frankly, said the photographer, I don't have much use for your modern art, your abstract stuff. It, I don't get it, okay? And, and that is what people understand. And that is why I went into photography. I went into something real. I take pictures. Now today, a picture can be about anything because you can Photoshop it, you can mess with it, you can morph things and all the rest of it. You know. But there was a day when somebody had a photograph, that was proof. Even in a trial, if somebody had a photograph, that was proof of something, right? You remember those days, Perry Mason and all that, right? It was proof. Nowadays, I don't know how you could take any of it as proof because it's all, you know, been morphed. A lot of it's been morphed or photoshopped or whatever. And uh, one of the artists responded and said, I'd like to see some of your realism. I'd like to see some of your realism. I'd like to see some of your pictures. Okay. Well, with that, the ph photographer led the artist into his booth at the gallery and showed him a picture of a barn that he was quite proud of. A barn. Okay. Now, a lot of people like pictures of barns, right? And, or anything country, you know, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But this guy is bringing it up and he, and he shows him a picture of a barn that he was proud of. He says... The artist says, this is amazing. How did you ever find a barn so small? Right, Jim? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. And what about those small animals in the picture? That's not reality. Amen? Even that is not reality. You know what the guy meant, but that is still, you're supposed to imagine that that's real, and the picture is not real. The thing it's of is real, but the picture, there's a little tiny barn, and there's little tiny animals, and that's imaginary, right? <laughs> okay? But you have to see the stone rolled away, don't you? you got to see it. Yeah, all selfish hindrances are gone when you see the stone rolled away. You have to see and hear the messenger in the case of what we're looking at here from the angel. Okay? And letting the fear roll away. You have to actually seek this risen Jesus. You have to see what he was risen from. Even death for your sake. So, go. Go where he tells you to go. He said, I want you to go to Galilee. And what's going to happen there? You're going to see me. Told him to tell the disciples that. You go to Galilee, you all go to Galilee. And you'll see me. And that's another one of the actual resurrection appearances. It's not a joke. It's not imaginary. Really, everything else is, in a sense. The true reality is Jesus raised for us. It's no joke. It's the realest thing there ever was. And there is nothing foolish about that. You remember the famous story of the missionaries down in South America. They went down there just to give people Jesus. They were focusing on this one particular tribe, trying to reach them, trying to get to them. And um, it turns out that they were scared uh, obviously, and uh, they caught them at the 
so-called landing strip on the beach and, and massacred them. Massacred them. Including a fellow by the name of Jim Elliot. Now Jim Elliot's wife is Elizabeth Elliot and she's the prolific author. I think I remember something about her passing away but I'm not sure about that. But um, Anyway, that's, that's the Elliots. That's, what I'm, that's whom I'm talking about. Okay. Well, Jim Elliot was known to have said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Think about it. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And that's not just one day out of the year. That's not just April 1st. Even this April 1st. That's every day. So people do continue to choose to be the fool. But Jesus is clearly calling us away from foolishness. And right into the reality of both the cross and the empty tomb. Because like I told the kids, you can't get to the empty tomb without death first, right? There's got to be death on the cross first before he would have ever been put in the tomb. And once he was in the tomb, it's three days and three nights and bam, he's out of there. Amen? That's not imaginary. It's not a joke. That's for real. Amen? And that is the best news I think that can ever be given. Someone once said, the best news ever came from a graveyard. Amen? Because there you have not only the, uh, the death nearby, and the business of being in the graveyard, but the graveyard itself, which now the tomb is empty. And that's the best news that's ever been given. But it came from a graveyard. It doesn't seem like that would be normal or natural. But that's the case of it. Amen? So love this Jesus. Amen? Every time you see a lily, every time you think back to even this day, no. Every time you see that lily, <laughs> amen? You've got to know it's Jesus who gave her. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this Easter Sunday. I know a lot of people don't want to hear about it. They don't want to receive it. They think they're in control. And they're not. I pray, dear God, that we would, every one of us, Lord, would see that we are not in control. It's God. It's Jesus. It's you. And we want to thank you for that. Help us, dear God, to always embrace the living Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be to God Almighty. We, we give you all praise, honor, and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.